<laughs> so we proved the product rule. Now we're going to use the product rule. Uh, let's summarize this real quick and put it inside of a box. Did we do that with the other derivatives? Yes, we did. At the very end of this section, I'll put, I'll write all the derivatives in one single box. We'll just summarize them all in one box. So you can just flip right to that uh, part in your notes. If I don't keep writing the of x, of x, of x part, this looks just like f g prime equals f prime g plus f g prime. So I didn't write the of x, of x, of x, of x every time. The of x is parentheses? Parentheses x, yeah. So this is the right side of what I wrote here is exactly that right there. I just didn't keep writing the of x, of x, of x part. because it's not necessary to, you can see the structure without that in there, basically. And we write these at the end, we'll use u's and uh, u and v for the two functions. All right, so use this product rule here to find this derivative. Where are we? Here we are. Three x squared minus four times x to the fifth minus square root x. So before you can even use a product rule, you need to rewrite square root with a power. So rewrite square root with a power, and then you can use the product rule. And just remember, you got your function f of x and your function g of x right here. So you can even write fx equals 3x squared minus 4, and you're going to need f prime. So you need to take a derivative of f, and then do the same thing for g. g is x to the fifth, and here we'll write x to the 1 half power, and you have to figure out what is g prime, and then multiply them carefully, put them and add them together. So that's how they fit back together. So we've got f prime, g prime, and then put them back in the product rule form. And don't watch what I do. So what I did on the board, you can look at it now, is algebra first, calculus second. What you did was calculus first. I didn't use a product rule at all. I mean, I did the product by multiplying, but I didn't use a product rule whatsoever. So what's a pro I may have messed up on my powers. So our first term, 3x to the 
seventh is 3x squared times x to the fifth, and we got negative 4x to the fifth is negative 4 times x to the fifth. That's inside, and then I went in the on my derivative step. Yeah. Um, so I did 3 times the 5 halves right there to get 15 halves. So you can't find g of x in here because I didn't, I, I sort of destroyed them. I mean, I destroyed them. This is, uh, this is g times f. This whole thing is g times f, which you never, I'm doing it a different way. So are you saying that we can do it either way? I will say that when, I, when we see that it's the same thing, yes. So what do you want us to look at so we're not confused? Just relax. Okay. <laughs> Sit back. I'm going to do what you most likely did if you did it correctly. So what I'm doing now should match, uh oh, that's not f prime. That's regular. f, 6x, x fifth, plus f, 3x squared minus 4, g prime. Okay, so that's what you got. Hopefully. Any questions on product rule? Yes, sir. How did you get 6x? Uh oh. Where is that? That's just the derivative of the 3x squared minus 4. Oh, okay. That's, that's that guy right there. Oh, uh, okay. So I lined up the, I wrote f prime g plus fg prime, so I would be able to piece together each of these. So, so let's get through the, so I just picked f and g off of f was the first function that was there uh, being multiplied and g was the second function being multiplied. So I just went here and said, all right, f's the first one, g's the second one. So that's how I got the f and g on the left. And then I took their derivatives, which were basically just came down to pretty much the power rule for the f prime and the g prime. I mean, there's a, the sum rule and the constant multiple rule and all that. So I took their, so any questions getting to f prime or g prime? Okay, so the negative x to the one Yes. So there's a big difference between this being a minus versus that being a minus. So if your power is negative, it's a reciprocal. It'd be like 1 over square root x. And if you're subtracting, that doesn't have to do with reciprocal. It just means add the negative. So depending on where the negative it is, it means something very different. Yeah, my question is like, you know, the last question is that is from 25. Because everything is understand 25. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, um, so is your question down in, in this part? Yeah, yeah, this part. So 25. This with that one. Oh, that one. Yeah, oh, and So that's Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was written really. Uh, yeah, I think my square root looked kind of like that. Yeah, yeah. Because if you put square outside, wanna be like you know x, you know 
Sorry about that. Okay. So uh, we're going to multiply all this out and then simplify it. And it better turn into this other one that I wrote down, or else something weird is going on. All right, last question. We have the same question. <laughs> Good. Did we just show the steps I got 6x? Because um, we, we understand you got the 6x, but what happens to the negative the minus 4? Oh, that's a good question. So I could write minus 0 if I was being yeah, yeah. careful or not lazy. So derivative of a constant zero. is 0. I think that was the first derivative we did. So I just kind of skipped over that, okay. talking about that step. So any constants when you take derivative are going to disappear. So plus something, minus something, uh, as long as it's a number, it's going to disappear. All right, so FOIL, the, expand these out, and then there should be hopefully four terms total when you simplify. So expand these out, and then combine like terms. And be careful, you make sure you add your powers correctly, because you're going to have these weird half powers hanging around. So add your fractions carefully. Any algebra simplifications? I know there's a lot of adding of fractions that was not terribly, well, they're only halves. They're not too bad. Any questions on that algebra? Yeah. So we. On the last one, you got sign x to the fourth. Should I be x to the Yeah, I did get that term. That's one of the terms. So I get four, t I'm doing a real FOIL, like first, last, outside, inside. I may not have done that order because I don't pay attention to the order, but you get four terms out of this product right here. Oh, you just kind of like... I FOILed. Oh, no. Uh, I FOILed all that out. I don't, I don't really pay attention to what order I FOIL in. I just, I usually do the first times the first, always first. Oh, I see this in that oh, okay. There's four terms that came out of that, and they're... Those four right there. So the reason I did this, it takes a, quite a bit of time to do this algebra, but we got to the same answer in very, very different ways. It almost seems like it was lucky that we got the same thing, because we got there two completely different ways. Uh, it's not coincidence that we got the same thing. This will always work out if you do it correctly. So you could either 
uh, do your calculus first or your algebra first, and then the other one second. And it doesn't matter which one you do first, as long as you're actually doing algebra correctly, as long as you're doing calculus correctly. So here's the first time you can see it doesn't matter which you do first, as long as you're doing them correctly. So sometimes, in this example, I think it's easier to, at least I found it faster to multiply first and then take the derivative. But a lot of times, it's going to be faster to do the product rule instead of actually doing the product and then taking the derivative. So it all depends on which, uh, what you start with as to what's the fastest way to get the derivative. There's not always a single fastest way. I can't say the product rule is always better than distributing because it's not true. If I asked you a slightly different question like, uh, let's see, well we don't really know how to do this one yet, but if this was raised to the 30th power, you wouldn't want to expand it out 30 times. So there's going to be a way we can deal with that as well. So that would be a really bad move to expand it out unless you had a computer that could do it in one second and then take the derivative. So you could probably do that on Wolfram in two steps with some copying and pasting if you got that one. Expand and then take derivative. But doing it by hand would be insane. So we'll write that moral of the story. You can do calculus and algebra in any order. I recommend you don't try to simplify and take a derivative in one step. That's not generally a good move. So as you're doing each single step, just do either calculus or algebra. Don't try to do both. Take a derivative and simplify in your head. I don't recommend doing that uh, until you're somewhere around Calc 3 or Calc 4. And then you can start doing things like that. But you don't want to do it right now. So I'm going to write the quotient rule. And we're not going to prove the quotient rule. And then we're going to actually go and use the quotient rule. So here's the quotient rule. So derivative of f divided by g is f prime x g of x. So it starts out looking kind of similar, except in the quotient rule, it's minus regular f g prime. And you divide by g of x squared. So that might seem a little strange. So it looks a little like the product rule on the numerator. And then you divide by the whatever original denominator squared is. So that's the quotient rule. And let's go ahead and use it for this problem. So I put a super easy function in the denominator. So just like your first chain rule, write out this is f of x. That's g of x, so f of x numerator, g of x denominator. You need a f prime and g prime. And then put them back into the quotient rule. And simplify at the end. You know, Combine like terms, all that fun stuff.
Oh, that was a big mistake. Yep, I drew a G, not G prime. That changes things quite a bit. Can I simplify? Well, any mistakes remaining after the one I just corrected? Can I simplify this any further? Or can I rewrite it differently? Yes. I can. There's actually. A kind of? You can make them two different fractions. So, yeah, we'll split this into two separate fractions. And then the first fraction will simplify really nicely. Oh no. Yes, it would be. Oh yeah, I put G. Ah, oh, goodness. Unfortunately, you're right. X squared minus X. Okay. So the short answer is the x squareds cancel, but not the way you're probably thinking. So there's two ways to simplify this. Here's one way. So we got 1 plus 1 over x squared. There is another way to simplify it, although it's going to look weird. You can factor an x squared on the numerator. And then you can cancel your x squareds that way. So if you want to cancel your x squareds, that's how they cancel. I so I uh, just multiplied. Oh, two x squared minus one x squared is just uh, one x. So I, I did a. Uh, those, the x's completely got rid of each other. So we simplified it really nicely. All right, so we got 1 plus 1 over x squared. Now my question is, could I have done some simplification or change around, just do algebra first? I could have done something really similar first, split this fraction up into basically three fractions added together. So let's do that instead. So I'm going to put all this stuff away in a box because I'm going to write below it. So splitting this up, we have x squared over x minus x over x minus 1 over x. So now we need to simplify these and write all these as powers of x. I don't necessarily need to use the quotient rule. You could do triple quotient rule or quotient rule on all three of these pieces, but that's a little bit insane. Uh, the middle one, for example, is 1, and the derivative of 1 is 0, which you would find if you did the quotient rule. But you're going to spend some time doing the quotient rule. So the first one simplifies just down to x minus 1 minus x to the negative first power. And now the derivative, the calculus step, we've spent some time doing algebra, the calculus step is going to be super fast right here. Because this is just, uh, what do you call it, the power rule right here. So this derivative is 1 minus 0 plus x to the negative 2.
which is the same thing we got going the quotient rule route. So again, we got to the same exact answer, but went a completely different way. And it should, at this point, it should feel very coincidental. And it still feels coincidental for me, even though I've done lots of derivatives. This is probably my, I don't know, 20th derivative in my life. Well, probably 1,000th, 20th derivative in my life, but. So algebra first, calculus first, doesn't matter as long as you do it correctly. It's not always easy to see that you can simplify something quickly. So a lot of times you'll do calculus without thinking, even though you look back at your quiz and be like, oh man, I could have simplified and did my calculus in like 10 seconds if I just spent a minute doing algebra. So we'll do a little bit of theory for a minute. So the derivative is a functor. So that might be a new word. My R looks like an N, but is supposed to be an R. So I didn't misspell function. This is a word functor. So what does a functor do? It should be something like a function. So what a functor does, its input is functions, and it outputs other functions. So it's sort of like a function. Technically, it is a function. It just doesn't eat numbers. Well, it can't eat numbers. It, it'll always give you 0 for every number that it eats. Uh, but it eats way more than numbers. So the derivative is a functor. And what that means, it eats functions and outputs functions. That should be one word. So the derivative as an operator looks like d over dx. So if you're going to apply it to something, you write it like that usually. And if we write this out with a domain and a range, what type of functions can I take a derivative of? Can't do it for every single function. So uh, some continuous functions, there's a special word that tells you you're able to differentiate a function. Differentiable functions. So it can differentiate any differentiable function. So over here, we have differentiable functions, or diffable functions. Now, there are functions whose derivative is not differentiable, but I don't think I will give you any of those functions. So what I'm going to do over here on the right side, the functions we're going to use, their derivative will also be differentiable as well. So in our world, the output of a derivative will be another differentiable function. So the range is differentiable functions. Yeah, I don't know why I spelled it out all the way. I said I wouldn't do that. So let's not do that. So it eats differentiable function and gives you a differentiable function. So we saw that. Uh, this function, could you take a derivative of that guy? Yep. Not hard to do. Just write that last one as uh, x to the negative 2 power like it was written there. And you take another derivative. There are very few functions who whose derivative is the function itself. There's very few functions. The only one you've seen, if you took a derivative of 0, that's the only example we have. What's the derivative of 0? Zero? 0. So we have a kind of a lame example of a function whose derivative is itself. You have to wait till calc 2. You'll find some other functions who, well, there's only one function whose derivative is itself that I can think of. That's not this function. And if you go to calc 2, you're going to find out that this function, uh, this functor, basically has an inverse called an integral. But that's all I'm going to say about calc 2 right now. And the inverse operation is way harder than the original operation. 
Not to say derivatives are easy, but compared to antiderivatives, they're relatively easy. Uh, and so you could think of this chain going on and on. Some other diffable functions. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Take as many derivatives as you want. Correct. No integrals this chord. Well, no, that's not true at all. No, we do integrals at the end. We just only do u sub. So we only scratch the surface of antiderivatives, basically. In Calc 2, you learn a lot of the, um, anti, uh, the integral rules, basically. So this means I can apply derivative twice if I want to, or three times, or 10 times. So let's go ahead and apply the derivative twice. So two ways to write it. You can write ddx ddx, which is do the derivative twice of, and we're going to do 5x minus x squared plus x to the 3 halves. So how do you find the derivative twice? You find it once, and then you take the derivative of the derivative. So you could add some extra parentheses like this. So evaluate the inside. First take the derivative, and then take the derivative of that result. And there should just be power rule right here, so just do the power rule carefully. doesn't matter what kind of power you have, you bring the power down. So fractions, yes. Whole numbers, yes. But then you add another power to the x? I drop the power by 1. Yeah. So multiply by original power. The power becomes a coefficient, basically, and then you drop the power by 1. And make sure if you have fractions that you're careful when you take away 1. And especially if they're negative, you've got to be double careful. Yeah, this should work on web work right here. If, if, it asks for, if this was the web work question, that should be an acceptable answer. Yeah, I mean, like, you took it a step farther. Like, you could leave it as, like, um, maybe 3 half minus 1. Oh, yeah, but I mean, you should be able to subtract halves at this point, definitely. Even though web work will let you be lazy, I'll probably take a point off if I see your, your power is something like uh, 1 half minus 1 and you just leave it like that. I'll probably take a point off for being lazy. Something like that, you should be able to subtract that. Sorry. I think you forgot it like negative. Uh oh. Negative, both square. Yeah, negative. The last, the last one. Oh, I took, so I took the yeah. power, so it's a negative, so it's a reciprocal. Mm -hmm. So if you write it as a reciprocal, the power would become positive. Yeah, so the intermediate step, if you want, is uh, 3 over 4x to the positive half power, oh, and then it's a square root. Yeah, yeah, I got 
So the 0 minus 2, 3, 4, that mm -hmm. line right there, that's the second derivative that we took? Yeah, so I'm done. Technically, this would be, this is a correct unsimplified answer. Yeah, so I'm done doing calculus at that point, and I'm just doing algebra. So I think web work would take that answer too. And I would, that would be an okay answer on your test as well. Uh, but again, if you might as well, you don't need the 0 minus 2. You can just write minus 2. So other ways to write this. So we'll just talk about notation for a minute. Because you might see some, especially if you're looking at uh, other people's notes online, whether it's uh, videos or Khan Academy or just written out notes, or if you use a different textbook. So I use this notation on our last problem. You might see it written like this. So d over dx squared means there's two of them next to each other. So in this case, it doesn't mean you can, you don't really want to think about multiplication because if you do, you might try to commute and change the order here. And that's not what's happening. These are functors, or you can think of them as they're functions, so you can't just change the order that they're written in. So don't, you can't quite treat it like multiplication because it actually operates on what's on the right side. So it's an operator that operates on what's the right side. And if you want to, you can always use an extra parentheses if that makes you think about functions, because it's operating on what's in the parentheses next to it. So you might see it written like this. This notation you may see as well. And the first time you see it, you should think, hey, shouldn't we group up the dx like this? And the answer is yes, you should. But when you write dx, it's treated as one whole piece. So dx is one piece that so you can't separate the d from the x. Just like if I had a function like sine of x, you can't, this is not si of n of x. You can't break up the sine function like that. Like we think that's silly because we know all about sine. That sine is one whole piece, you can't just break out part of it like that. Uh, the same thing is true with dx. dx is one piece. You can't just break the x off of there uh, until you do later on in calculus. But for us right now, it's one piece. Uh, and you can never do what I did in, with sine over. That, that's never ever going to work. And the other way, and of course you can use prime notation. So you could of course write fx double prime or you could write, you could put your double prime right on the f function. And if we want to go to higher order derivatives, like we want the 20th derivative, I think it, you can see the 20th derivative would be insane to write like that. dx, 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 all that. So obviously, oh, you would use the one of the other notations. For example, uh, the d over dx to the 20th power would be a good one. So higher order derivatives. So if we wanted 20 derivatives, the 20th derivative of f, we could write like this. And there is a, now, That would be crazy. So we don't want to write that. It's tempting to use tally marks, but that's only good till about 20 or 30, and then that becomes insane. So we have this parenthesized notation. It looks like you owe money to your bank, but what it means is that many derivatives. So it's a little bit strange. You, it looks like an exponent, but when it's just in parentheses, that means that many derivatives. And I would say somewhere around the fourth derivative is where it begins to be silly to keep writing tick marks. The third derivative is reasonable. Fourth derivative is sort of reasonable. Once you hit five, you have to sit there and count out how many of those marks there are. So higher order derivatives, you'll generally write them like this if you need to. So 
So we're at the end of 3.3, and we're about to start derivative as rate change, so this is a good place to stop where we are.